Well, we are in part four, the last part of uh, our in route series. And over the past few weeks, we've been talking about desert experiences that um, for all of us, at some point in time and following Jesus, eventually you find yourself in a place where it didn't quite go the way you thought it was gonna go. And it's almost as if you've reached a, you know, a, a, an impasse. You're in this deserted, desolate place that, that it seems like maybe the things you prayed for didn't work out the way that they did or, or you've received that like, information you didn't wanna get, the job is over, the diagnosis has come, or, or you, you're kinda of in a place where, where you, you don't know what the answer is to the block that's in front of you. You don't know the solution to the problem you're facing. Uh, and we said that maybe you're not stuck, you're just en route. Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe there's something that God's working on in you and through you, um, and we've been wrestling with that for four weeks. Now, if you feel like you're coming in at the end of the movie, like today's your first day with us, and you're like, I have no idea what's going on, have no fear. Go to tcat.church slash en route, um, and you can check out all the messages before. You can see my notes at the bottom if you're like, I don't wanna watch him for 30 minutes. Totally cool, I get it. Um, you can read my notes, go through some discussion questions. Uh, but the thing is, we would really love for you to wrestle with this material because, um, um, this is an experience that is not just like a singular, like people, ever, all of us face this. This is something that you're gonna face sooner or later. And we don't sugarcoat things here. We tell you the truth about what it looks like to follow Jesus. And this is just something that happens. And so we want you to be prepared. We want you to wrestle with it because also um, your faith is gonna grow in the midst of that. When our faith intersect, intersects with God's faithfulness, our faith grows. And we feel like these things are big places that that can happen. We've been calling them desert lessons, right? Um, we're using the Exodus story. If you're not familiar with that, in the Old Testament, the second book of the Old Testament, uh, so Genesis, Exodus, uh, is the story of the Israelite people and how God redeemed them out of slavery and made them his people. And we've been talking about really just kind of the beginning part of their journey when after uh, God led them out of Egypt and you know Pharaoh's army is destroyed and they're all out, they sing songs and they're happy and God's given them this great promised land. He's, he's, he's promised them great things. And rather than taking them straight there, we had the scripture tells us that, that he led them way south, right? That way, they, they took them the long way around and we were trying to figure out why. Well, what we said was that this was an opportunity for God to gain the trust of his people. In other words, to prove himself trustworthy. Um, last week I said a phrase something like this that we don't really know what our faith is until it's put to the test. We don't really know what we believe until we have to wrestle with it and see it put out. Because you can say stuff intellectually, right? You can, you can think things, but when you're in the moment and you face kind of difficulties where you have to make decisions based on what you say you believe, that's when your faith is really revealed. In other words, we put it like this. When our active faith intersects with God faithfulness, our faith grows. Our active faith, I don't mean like, you know, because we talked about this idea that you can follow Jesus, you can believe in Jesus, and you can follow Jesus, and those are two different things. Uh, I think we're asked to do both, but for somewhere along the way, church world has become just like, well, I believe that, and I'm fine now. Well, actually, Jesus said, I want you to follow me. <laughs> I want you to put that faith into action. I want you to, you know, I want you to follow behind me. We're going someplace. We have a destination in mind, and when you start doing that, and you put your faith in action, God's faith intersects with that and works uh, its, its uh, wonder, and you come out on the other side more faithful than you were before. Now, it's easy to talk about that in this lab environment, right? But when you're in the moment where the doctors looked at you and told you something that you did not wanna hear, it's a lot harder, right? Do I believe that God has my best in mind in this moment when I'm facing all these difficulties and all these kind of pivotal circumstances? That's really when you find out what it is that you believe. And that's kind of what we wrestled with the first couple of weeks. We've been talking about really five ways our faith grows. Uh, I want to zero in on personal ministry today, but here's the list one more time of the five things we've been talking about over the past few weeks. I won't go through them again because for those of you all have been here the whole time, if not, check these out. But these are really just five things that make your faith grow. You ever wanted to know what makes your faith grow, these are five things. I'm not saying it's the end all be all list, but it's really five big ones and it's what we center all our ministry on here at TCAT. But I want to zero in on personal ministry today for a couple reasons. One, I think it really fits the theme of what we've just been through over the past few minutes because without a starting point coach and without people who served and handed out and made this place available on Sunday morning, we would not have been able to baptize someone who desperately needed to be free from their past. And so I think personal ministry is huge for what we think about um, within how we affect and, and are part of this bigger world that's together. The other part is this is really the last desert test that God gave his people before he led them to Sinai. And Sinai is 19 and 20 in the, uh, chapter 19 and chapter 20 in the book of Exodus. Um, and so we're gonna be in 18 today, kind of right before that moment. 
Sinai is really when God showed up and said, okay, you're mine and I'm yours. Let me tell you how this is all gonna work. But before that, this whole desert experience was him gaining their trust, saying, look, you can trust me. I, I'm here, trust me, trust me, trust me. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And the last do you trust me experience is the one we're gonna talk about today. Now, this is an interesting one because um, it actually speaks to something that a lot of us uh, don't like to think about a lot, and it's actually a lesson that comes through the father-in-law. Uh, so uh, we're gonna talk about a character today named Jethro. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't prep my mother-in-law for this, but whenever I think of Jethro, I've always thought of my father-in-law, Herb. Uh, always. I, I don't know why. Ever since I met Shanna and, and we got married, I, I have put my father-in-law in place of this because he was a wise man who wasn't afraid to say what needed to be said, but to say it in love. And that was, that was the epitome of my father-in-law. Now, I don't know if you have a good relationship with your father-in-law, okay? If not, pretend everything I just said over the past five seconds doesn't apply. But Jethro was a guy who had Moses' best interest in mind and was a guy who loved his daughter an awful lot. And so Jethro, this experience, what we're gonna share today, Moses has led the people out into the desert and he's done all these great things and he gets a visit from his father now. Now, men, just for a minute, Early on in your marriage, especially when your father-in-law comes by, you're one to impress them and say, look, you know, I'm taking good care of your daughter. Look, everything's going well. Look at me, I got a good job. And so Moses is kind of in that mode when Jethro comes. And so he's like, you know, he takes him around and shows him the tent. And he goes, look, this is where God comes down and speaks to me personally. And, and this is where, you know, we can give burnt offerings to God and, and look at all the things he's done. And, and Jethro is actually really excited. He shares praises and he becomes a believer as well in the Lord. He says that the Lord is great. In fact, he talks about how arrogant Pharaoh must have been to deny God. And so Moses is feeling really good about himself because his father-in-law is impressed um, and he's showing him all the great things that have been done, right? Well, then the next day happens and there's this really interesting kind of encounter that Moses reveals something about himself and Jethro gives, himself, gives a truth that I think is applicable to all of us. So here's how that story goes here in Exodus chapter 18. The next day, after all of the good stuff had happened, Moses took his seat as judge for the people and they stood around him from morning till evening. So what would happen is there's two million people and Moses is the only guy, okay? And so he would just like sit in this chair and they would come and bring him the most ridiculous things. Like, um, so my chicken laid an egg, but it laid an egg in his tent and he's claiming that egg to be his, but it came from my chicken, what should we do? And Moses would answer these questions, okay? And he did that from morning till evening, two million people standing in line to talk to the only guy who had authority in the camp. <laughs> Now, interesting enough, it says, when his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing? In other words, what are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you doing this? Why is this the way they react? Now, Moses reacts the way I would have reacted. Um, he got defensive and defended his position, saying, like, I have to do this. But basically, he starts like this. Moses answered him, because... Okay, just because, this is the way that it is. God chose me, right? He didn't choose you, Jethro, he chose me. And I am the guy that's in charge and he put me here in this position and these people have things they need answers to. So because, it has to be this way, there is no other way. And then the most beautiful words in the Old Testament as far as I'm concerned, and I know that's a huge statement, but it, like this one has been life-changing for me personally. And so here it is, Moses' father-in-law said, what you're doing is not good. In other words, this thing, this way you're doing this, this is not a good plan. This is not, this is not good. He doesn't, he doesn't say, Moses, you're a fool. He doesn't say, Moses, like you're a terrible person. He just says, listen, I got a truth for you. I got some advice. Like, listen, this thing you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. And then he goes, let me share some advice with you, okay? Uh, and he says, the work is so heavy. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. And he shares what I have coined the Jethro Principle, copyright 2022 Church Tuscaloosa. Okay, I, don't, I can't, it's not fair. But he shares what I think is the most valuable thing that people say about the way that this whole church thing is supposed to work. Okay, um, but let me just say to those of you who are leaders in your industry, if you own your own business, if you're a manager, if, if there are people that are underneath of you, what I'm about to say over these next couple minutes is actually really important for you too. I think this Jethro principle applies not just to church life, but, but to all of us who consider ourselves to be leaders. Jethro begins to lay out Moses' situation in a way that he can step back from and go, listen, here's why this isn't working out. 
And he gives them really four pointers, okay? There's really four things that Moses says, and here's, or Jethro says to Moses, here's what they are. First of all, there are things that only you can do. Moses, you are the guy who God chose, right? You're the guy who, who he said wanted to be his, his prophet and to speak his will. Um, there are things that only you can do. No one else can do those things. But hey, listen, there are other things that have to be done. There are other things to do. Doesn't mean you have to do them, Moses, right? And, and I might say, Jethro goes a step further and says, every time you do something that's not what you, only you can do, you've actually robbed an opportunity from somebody else to do something they're gifted for. And you're putting yourself in a position where you're gonna be the only guy at the top of a pyramid that no one can climb. And when you're gone, who else is gonna be able to take over this thing? Who else is gonna be able to lead these people? Do you imagine that you're gonna live forever? Then he goes on, he says, find others to do other things. Find other people to do those things, the things that, that you, you know, that other people can do. Why don't you delegate some of this? Why do you have to be the guy all the time, Moses? There's plenty of capable people around you. Don't hoard the authority, share it around. And then, this is, the, this is huge, Jethro says to train, empower, and release them. And that's big, especially for those of you that consider yourself to be leaders in your industry. There are things that only you know how to do. And there are things that are, you know, we call them, my dad used to call them trade secrets, right? Like this is job security for me. And maybe you think that about a lot of the things that you know as well. But the thing is, you can't do this forever. And if you want this to be a legacy, if you want this movement that you've created, or again, and thinking in the context of the church, you want it to keep going, then you got to train, empower, and release other people to be a part of what you're doing. Now, Moses' father-in-law was a really smart guy, right? He was a pretty smart guy because he spoke these words thousands of years ago. And still to this day, people are writing books. And if you pay really close attention to most leadership books, they're going to come down to have these four points in them somewhere. There are things that only you can do, but there are other people that are around you. So what if you were able to train them and empower them and let them do part of what you're doing so that you can multiply your efforts and make a bigger difference? Now, here's what's interesting for the guys in the camp. Let me just point this out for a minute, okay? Two million people walked out of Egypt with Moses. Two million people walked across the Red Sea, but they were guys, who, uh, men and women, who were in, in chains, in slavery, just a month before this happens, less than a month. I think it was 15 days that they'd been journeying in the desert. The only training they'd had was, okay, lay your chains down and let's walk through the Red Sea and we're gonna follow the leader through this desert university that God has created for us till we get to this place. They were not people who had college degrees. Uh, they were not people who were like, you know, skilled in leadership things. And so when Moses starts going around the camp to start picking people to delegate to, they had that internal feeling of, I don't know that I'm capable of doing this. This feels too big for me. Have you ever been asked by someone to do something and that's been your reaction, right? That's like, hmm, I don't know, can I do this? Am I big enough? Like, I don't know. And the whole camp was full of people like that. So Moses picked like, you know, a dozen people and brought them up and he put them in charge of different groups and different things and activities. But these were people who had no idea what they were doing until they got there. But here's the thing, these new leaders were nudged out of their comfort zone and everyone was the better for it. Moses was the better for it. They were the better for it because then they got to share in what God was doing. And the people, gosh, the people were the better for it because then they had access to more people who could help them with what was going on. They were nudged out of their comfort zone, but everybody was the better for it. Do you know what I've known? I've been in church ministry for like 16 years now. Um, and I, I've, whenever I talk about personal ministry, there are three or four statements that I always hear from people when they talk about it in their faith story. So if like I, I called some of you have been Jesus followers for a long time, if I called you up here and said, hey, tell me about your faith. Something like this is gonna come out of your mouth when you were talking about being asked to do something. So you got put in charge and you said something like, you know, I was so nervous. Gosh, I was just so nervous. They asked me to lead this kids group and I'm like, I don't even like kids. How am I supposed to do this? And they put me behind that wall and I was just so nervous. Or, oh, you know what, I was in over my head. I felt like, gosh, these people need so much and this is such a weighty ministry and they've asked me to be a part of this. And oh my gosh, I was just, I just felt so over my head. Or this is a big one. I felt inadequate and unqualified. Lord, this task is just so big. I, I just didn't feel like I had the skills. I didn't feel like I, I, I was adequate. And then after they tell kind of the beginning details of the story, whatever ministry it was that they were serving in, this comes out of their mouth almost every single time. But I knew it was what God wanted me to do. I knew it was what God wanted me to do. Now, 
You may have been asked to do something in your past and you've said no, okay? And, and I, I'm not judging you, that's okay. I'm talking specifically about the people who got asked and prodded and nodded by the Holy Spirit to be a part of a ministry, to be a part of something in their faith, and they were nervous about it, but looking back on it now, they knew it was what God wanted them to do. They knew it was what God wanted them to do. And in fact, they're the better for it today. Now here's the thing. Jethro's principle applies to all of us. It's the lesson in the desert. And here's why I think it is the case, okay? One of the desert experiences that we often face is feelings and inadequacy. Like I just, I don't know that I have the skills I need here, God. Like I'm facing this test and I'm in this space and I don't know that I have all the answers. Well, what we've done when we say, I don't have all the answers, is we've practically said, God, I have to have all the answers, so you give me what I need. Rather than saying, God, I don't know what to do, but you do. I can't, but you can through me. And so I came up with this statement, and, and, and I'm gonna read it to you, and then I'm gonna ask you to say it out loud with me, but here's, here's what it is. It's, you know, if we were to say in those situations, I'll do what I can do, and trust God to do what only he can do. How much different would our experience of church ministry go? You see, somebody said that, right? Somebody said that when they stepped in to become a starting point coach. I know Jana said that, I heard that before. People said this when they stepped in to start teaching and leading Bible studies. They, they say this when they step in to lead a small group and they're like, you know, I don't know that I know everything that I need to know, but I know God knows everything that he wants to happen. And so I'll do what I can do and trust God to do what only he can do. And everybody was the better for it. So I, just, I, I want to encourage you to read this out loud with me. And, I, and, and this is a crazy thing, but I, I want you to say it out loud. Say these words with me, okay? I'll do, back up, <laughs> I'll do what only I can do and trust God to do what only he can do. Let's do it one more time with feeling, okay? I'll do what I can do and trust God to trust God with only he can do. Well, you know, again, I, I teach this uh, at a men's retreat not long ago. I said um, the most powerful prayer that you can pray is, God, I just can't, but you can through me. I can't, but you can through me. And here's why, this uh, spoiler alert, pushing through our inadequacy in order to say yes to God for the benefit of other people grows our faith. When you decide that in the midst of an inadequate feeling when you've been asked to do something or the Holy Spirit's nudged you to do something and you're gonna step out and start a new ministry, you're gonna step out and lead a starting point group, you're gonna step out and become an adult small group leader, you're gonna step out and start serving your kids, you're gonna step out and start serving with students. When you do that, even though you feel inadequate, God provides and your faith grows and other people benefit the Jethro principle. And let me just say this, I'm not trying to guilt you, um, but this is something a mentor said to me years ago, and I've said it a dozen different ways throughout countless sermons that I've been here. So if you're a regular, you've heard me say this before, if you're new, jot this down, okay? You have no idea, you have no idea what or who hangs in the balance of your decision to remain faithful in the desert. You don't. You know, somebody's marriage could be in the balance of your decision to decide to lead Thrive. Somebody's kid could be in the balance of your decision to agree to step in and lead in kids' groups. Somebody's, somebody's faith, right? Somebody's freedom and the grace of Christ could hang in the balance of your decision to go, okay, the Holy Spirit is nudging me to do this. I need to say yes. You have no idea what or who hangs in the balance of your decision to remain faithful when you don't feel like remaining faithful. You just don't know. And when God is leading through these seasons in your life, if your reaction is to lean in and step Rather than pushing back, your faith will grow and I think you get the opportunity to do something God intended for you to do all along. Because personal ministry positions us. It positions us to experience God's power in our weaknesses. It gets us in a space where like, yeah, you know, you're right, you don't know how to do that, but hey, I'm God and I'm gonna help you do that. I'm gonna lean in and I'm gonna walk with you. I mean, what would it be like to go, you know, I, do, I don't have all the answers to this, but you know, I, I believe in you, God, and you've always proven yourself trustworthy to me, and so I think you want me to do this, so here I go. What would that feel like for you? And what might be on the other side of that decision? Personal ministry positions us also to experience God's faithfulness in response to our acts of faith. When you put your faith in action, when God asks you to, he gets to prove himself trustworthy. 
And I feel like a lot of our faith so many times becomes frail and fragile because we've not, God's like giving us opportunities to trust him. I know this is big, but look, if you do it, I'll prove myself to you. And in those moments when we deny God the opportunity to prove himself trustworthy, we deny ourselves a chance for our faith to grow. And so all in those moments when you feel nudged out of your comfort zone, when you feel pushed in a new direction, if you're willing to say yes to that, God's gonna show up because it was his idea anyway. And when he shows up, your faith is gonna grow and you get to see something amazing happen in somebody else's life. Jethro just looked at Moses and said, you're keeping people from experiencing the great things that God wants. You're denying people the opportunity to be a part of something bigger. This thing you're doing is not good. (laughs) Um, Let me just say this really quick. This is like, for those of you that are involved in TCAT, you consider this to be your church home. If I could just take 30 seconds to speak directly to you. If you're a guest, I want you to hear this as a charge I'm giving to everybody else who considers this to be their home. But listen to this for a minute. We will never make it. We will never make it where God wants us to go unless everyone is using their God-given gifts. I believe that. The vision and the mission that God has given us here at TCAT is way too big for any one of us to accomplish alone. And if we want to live into what we feel like God is doing and calling us to do in this community, if we wanna live into this, this dream of leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus for the benefit and for Tuscaloosa, we can't do that unless we're all firing on all cylinders. And so, if I might just say, uh, all those moments where you feel nudged to do something and you say no rather than yes, you're kinda of like, you're kinda of denying God the opportunity to do something more in this community that he's creating. And that's not a guilt thing, okay? I love you, and I'm gonna love you whether you serve, I'm gonna love you no matter what. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just saying, what if you're missing something that God wants to do in you and through you to make a massive impact in our community? But even if it's not even just in our community, in one person's life, what if you are the one? What if you are the one that God called to be there and present at the moment? You know? What if you're the person who's supposed to be there in that particular moment for someone's kid on the other side of this wall? What if your experience is the perfect one to be able to tell your story and share what's going on to lead someone into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, to show them the freedom that they could get? That's why I'm so proud of Charlene for sharing her story because it was so hard. But she knew, she just knew that on the other side of what God had given her, she couldn't keep the story to herself because it could help someone else. And like, if I could take that and bottle it and give it to all of you, that's what I would do. I think that's the big part of what it looks like to kind of be en route. We're not there yet. But a big step for you in following Jesus could be living into this. Now we're closing out our series today. We're gonna have a closer. The band's gonna come back up. I'm gonna pray. Um, But we're gonna close our series out with kind of a a great song that kind of puts the, the tip, you know, the icing on the cake for all of this. But as we do this, I want to challenge you with something. So I asked you not to give your connect cards away, right? Um, if you still have them and you remembered what I said, here's what I want you to do as we're going through this song. Uh, there's a little part in the bottom that says serve. It's right on the card. You're holding it. It's kind of on the, the right side of the card. If God's been nudging you that there's something you're supposed to do, some ministry you're supposed to be a part of, some thing that you're supposed to do, um, you know, we're not going to hound you. It's not like I'm going to come and like bang down your door. Um, but would you just signify that by putting that on the bottom of the card uh, today? That, you know what, God, I hear you. And here's what it is that I think God's called me to do. I need to go work with preschoolers. I need to go help in large group in elementary. I need to go be an adult small group leader. I, I, I need to serve on guest services. If there's just something that God is nudging you to do, would you write that down as a signal that, yo, God, I've got the message. <laughs> Um, And then we can pray for you and we'll reach out and, and, and pray for you that way. Let me pray for you now and then we'll close out our series. Father God, I thank you so much for these people and for these uh, amazing um, opportunities we have to share these stories. Lord, I just pray now that as we sing this final song, it will be uh, an anthem for us that no matter where we are, uh, highs, lows, pivotal circumstances, dark times, um, great times, you are still God and your anchor is still there for us and your grace is still true. God, would you just bless us with the reality that you are trustworthy. And when we feel nudged to take a step, give us the boldness and courage to take it. God, we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing. Sing, blessed be. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. We streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Go I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back.
Have a great week. We'll see you next week.